you don't mind if I finish eating my burger while I give this talk? <laughs> Actually, that might be a little disgusting. They're filming and they zoom in on my mouth. But seriously, who here thinks that hamburgers are delicious? Yeah, I'm not surprised. Pretty much everybody has their hand up. Me too. I love meat. I grew up in Oklahoma, and among my friends in high school, McDonald's Big Macs and Dairy Queen Blizzards were just about a religion. This faith had a holy trinity, the Big Macs and Blizzards would be joined by just about bacon anything. <laughs> then I showed up at college in 1987, and I met this guy who blew my mind. He told me he didn't eat meat. Didn't eat meat? Thought maybe he had a disease. <laughs> the idea of voluntarily not eating meat absolutely did not register. And quite honestly, it felt more than a little freakish. Flash forward 30 years, and I'm standing on this stage, and I've become pretty much what most of you would think of as a die-hard vegan. In fact, I've spent a lot of the last 20 years trying to convince people to stop eating dairy and eggs and meat, so pretty much full-on vegan advocacy. What I've come to realize, though, is that most people just really like eating meat. I don't know if it's physical or physiological or psychological or emotional, but it's true. Most people don't like it when I come along and tell them why they shouldn't. Obvious, right? Well, it took me a long time to figure this out. But I did figure it out. So I went from telling people why they shouldn't eat meat to telling people about alternatives. So telling people about plant-based sausage and plant-based chicken and plant-based burgers. And that burger I was eating when I walked out here, it's not made of animal meat. It's made from pea protein. Bill Gates called plant-based meat the future of food because the people making these new plant-based meats, they're getting better and better and better at biomimicking the taste, the texture, the aroma, everything that all of us like about eating meat. Except that when we go out and we decide what we're going to eat, we don't have to factor in ethical considerations. We just make our choices in the same way we always have. We think about culture or emotion or taste or convenience, whatever else, but the nature of the product is better. That's what turned me from being a diehard vegan activist into somebody who runs a nonprofit organization focused on food technology and culinary innovation. So basically, the quest for the perfect hamburger. But let me take a step back and tell you how I got here. So the year is 1987. I've just showed up at college, and I have nothing but time for the really big questions in life. Socrates' adage, the unexamined life is not worth living, that spoke to me. It's a powerful concept, and pretty much all philosophy of the last 2,500 years has been a variation on that theme. What does it mean to lead an examined life? So I got to college, and I joined an organization called Poverty Action Now. We organized campus-wide fasts to raise money for Oxfam International, and we volunteered at a soup kitchen on the weekends in the big city. Well, Des Moines. <laughs> it felt good. It felt like I was beginning to align my ethics with my actions. Then one of the other soup kitchen volunteers gave me a book called Diet for a Small Planet. Diet for a Small Planet clocks in at like 500 pages, but here's the Cliff Notes version. Farm animals have to eat, and they are extraordinarily inefficient at taking the soy, the wheat, the oats, whatever it is that we're feeding them. They don't do a good job at turning that food into meat. This just makes intuitive sense. I weigh about 180 pounds. If I do nothing but lay in bed watching reruns of the Jerry Springer show, I'm going to burn like 2,400 calories a day, except when something awesome is happening on the screen. I'm, Jerry, 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 you know, and it ticks up. My, my metabolism speeds up. Same thing is true of farm animals. You know, not that they have the bad taste to watch Jerry Springer, but that the vast majority of the calories that you feed to a chicken, a pig, a cow, whoever else, the vast majority they expend simply being, you know, getting to slaughter weight. So Gandhi, pretty good getting from Jerry Springer to Gandhi in like one minute, right? Uh, so Gandhi said probably 20 of the most powerful things that were ever said. One of the things Gandhi said that had a powerful impact on me, he said, think of the face of the poorest person you've ever seen and ask yourself if the action you contemplate will be of use to that person. Think of the face of the poorest person you've ever seen and ask yourself if the action you contemplate will be of use to that person. For me, the idea of eating something that required so many resources while people were starving made absolutely no sense. I didn't want to be a part of it, and I stopped eating meat immediately. After college, I decided 
to go work in a soup kitchen. I liked the soup kitchen volunteer work so much that I decided to go to work full time in a, in a soup kitchen in inner city Washington, DC. So feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, clothing the naked. But I didn't just want to act like Jesus, Matthew 25. I also wanted to look like Jesus. <laughs> another, another member of the shelter community gave me a book called Christianity and the Rights of Animals. It puts, its, it puts the argument into a faith context, uh, and that worked for me as a Roman Catholic. But it's really about a fairly universal concept. How should human beings interact with other animals on planet Earth? The chapter on factory farming absolutely blew me away. I just couldn't believe the hideousness with which animals were treated on these farms and in these slaughterhouses. And after a couple of years of talking with friends and family and praying about the issue and talking to my spiritual advisor, I followed my heart and I went to work at People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, running their anti-factory farming campaigns and their vegan campaigns. So for the next 13 years, I studied the myriad adverse impacts of industrial animal farming and I shared that information widely and vigorously. And quite honestly, I figured we couldn't lose because most people already agree with the basic principles that support an end to the industrial farming of animals. But let's test that thesis. We're gonna have a little audience participation. Who here thinks that we should try to eliminate global poverty from the face of the planet? Yeah, who thinks if you can make a choice that's good for the environment or bad for the environment, we should go with good for the environment? Who thinks we should be kind to animals? Yeah, pretty much everybody raised their hand for all of those questions. But I didn't just expect people to connect the dots, ask the questions, okay, go vegan. No, I piled on the facts. The more authorities and the more numbers, the better. So here are my five go-tos. Let's see what you think. Fact number one, meat is a huge contributor to climate change. Most of us, when we think about climate change, we probably think about driving less uh, or buying a hybrid. But according to the United Nations, more, more climate change is attributable to the meat industry than to all of the cars and trucks and trains and planes combined, the entire transportation sector. On a per calorie basis, according to the journal Nature, chicken is the least climate change inducing meat, and yet chicken causes 40 times as much, much climate change per calorie of protein when compared to legumes like soy and peas. Fact two, the widespread use of, of antibiotics on industrial animal farms is leading to antibiotic-resistant superbugs. According to a report from the UK government, these superbugs are slated to cost the global economy $100 trillion by the year 2050, and the threat to the human race from superbugs is more certain than the threat from global warming. Fact three, according to United Nations scientists, raising and killing animals for food is one of the major contributors to all of the world's most pressing environmental problems, including climate change, land degradation, air and water pollution, and loss of biodiversity. Fact four, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta says that tens of millions of people get sick every single year from eating contaminated meat. Tens of thousands of people end up in the hospital and more than 1,000 die. Fact six, University of Arkansas poultry researchers say that chickens now grow more than six times as quickly as they would naturally. The human baby grew as quickly as a modern broiler chicken. She would have made more than 600 pounds by the time she was two months old. Imagine that, human baby, 600 pounds, two months old. Every moment of these animals' lives is categorized by unmitigated misery. What do you think? All y'all going vegan? <laughs> no, changing our diet is hard, even if we agree with the basic principles that might support doing so. What I came to understand is that facts are not enough. Anti-factory farming activists have been arguing for fact-based diet change for decades, and yet per capita meat consumption is the highest it's ever been, and it's rising globally. But there is something I'm convinced can work. At the same time that I was arguing for fact-based global veganism, a small band of entrepreneurs was starting companies that were designed to compete with the products of industrial animal agriculture, what Bill Gates called the future of food. So I looked at what these companies were doing, and I thought about plant-based milk, almond milk and soy milk. 20 years ago, almond milk and soy milk, you couldn't find them in grocery stores. You couldn't find them in coffee shops. If you did track down a dusty carton of the stuff in the nether regions of your local co-op, tasted awful. In 20 years, they've gone from basically zero to more than 10% of the milk market, and the stuff tastes really good. If we do that with plant-based meat, getting from where we are now at basically zero to 10% of the market, that's 10% less of all of the harms that I was just laying out, and it's more than 900 million animals 
no longer relegated to industrial farms and industrial slaughterhouses. But we can do a lot better than 10%. I mean, Bill Gates called plant-based meat the future of food because it's the nature of markets that if you produce something that tastes the same or better, and because it's more efficient, it costs less, we should be able to get to 50%, 60%, 70%. But I am convinced that there are some people who simply are not going to give up eating animal meat. Some people, even if you got biomimicry with plants, it tastes better and it costs less, some people are just going to insist on eating meat. For them, we have something that's called clean meat. Clean meat is a real meat. You just take a biopsy from an animal and you feed the cells directly and it grows and you eat the meat, far more efficient. It's called clean meat mostly as a nod to clean energy. Clean energy is energy that's better for the environment. Clean meat is meat that's better for the environment. It causes a lot less of all of the harms that I just laid out, and it uses up to 99% less land, which means that you can repurpose that land for carbon sequestration, for the production of renewable energy. So you've actually got a product that frees up land and allows for the production of more energy than it actually requires to produce. And all of that energy is renewable, so that multiplies the positive climate impact. So here's a clean meat meatball, and here's some clean meat duck, and here's what clean meat production will look like at scale. It's your friendly neighborhood meat brewery. I'll spare you the image of the industrial farm and the industrial slaughterhouse, but suffice it to say the meat brewery is a lot more pleasant to look at so it's probably not going to surprise anybody in this room to hear that Google co-founder Sergey Brin is a big backer of these technologies. So too Bill and Melinda Gates, Richard Branson, some of the hottest venture capital funds in Silicon Valley, DFJ, Kleiner Perkins, Google, Google Ventures. But what might surprise you is that Tyson Foods is on board, the biggest meat company in, in the United States. So too Cargill, the largest privately traded company and the number three uh, meat company in the United States, so too PHW, which is basically the Tyson Foods of Germany. When Tyson CEO Tom Hayes, when they invested in plant-based meat, he said, for Tyson, plant-based meat is growing more quickly than animal-based meat. For us, we want to be where the consumer is. When we talk to corporate executives about plant-based meat and clean meat, when we talk about government policymakers and regulators, when we talk with venture capital funds uh, and philanthropists, they're excited about the fact that plant-based meat and clean meat are so much more efficient, so there's a lot more profit to be made. But they're also very excited about the fact that the products have so many benefits for humanity. Eric Schmidt said that plant-based meat is going to improve life for humanity by a factor of at least tenfold in the fairly near future, because it's an answer to two of humanity's biggest questions. First, how are we going to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050? And second, what are we going to do about climate change? Plant-based meat and clean meat require so many fewer resources that we can feed a lot more people for the same resource inputs, and also because they're so much more efficient, they cause a lot less climate change. Richard Branson declared that in 30 years, there will be no more industrial farming of animals. All meat is going to be either clean meat or plant-based meat. So now my entire life is devoted to that vision. My entire life is devoted to bringing that about as quickly as possible. I still believe in taking Socrates seriously. I still think that if we care about the global poor, about animals, about the environment, we shouldn't be eating meat. But two things. The first one is a lot of people just aren't going to incorporate ethics into what it is that they choose to eat. The second thing is even for the people who will, shouldn't we make it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing? And that's the beauty of food innovation, of food science and culinary innovation. As society shifts from animal-based meat to plant-based meat and clean meat, we get all of those benefits for the environment, for the global poor, for animals, and for global health. But the beauty of it is that nobody in society actually has to make their dietary decisions in a different way at all. We can all simply continue to choose what to eat on the basis of culture or familiarity or convenience or cost effectiveness, but most of all, we can choose foods that are delicious. Thank you. <laughs>